this afternoon, and that is Anne Osborne. In this lecture, Anne Osborne aims to share information that supports the fruit diet as being an optimal diet uh, for helping the body to heal from cancer. In today's world, there exists the point of view that fruit should be limited by those who have been diagnosed with cancer. Using examples and case histories uh, from the past 100 years, Anne will share what she has learned that supports the fruit diet as an aid to healing from serious health challenges. Anne began her journey on the fruit diet in 1991. She has raised two very happy and healthy children on this diet. Kepi, her younger child, has accompanied Anne to fruit festivals in Europe and to the United States. Has anyone been to the fruit festivals? Yes, two and three. Excellent. Anne's book, Fruitarianism, The Path to Paradise, was uh, published in English in 2009, and the Italian version, Fruitarismo, La Via Verso Il Paradiso, any Italians in the room? No? <laughs> was published in 2011 and is currently ex assistant executive director of the world's largest fruit festival held in New York State, US, uh, and is also freelance author and illustrator. Is anyone connected with Anne on Facebook? Have you seen her creations of uh, food artistry? Something amazing. I cannot find those pictures anymore. I had them in slides from presentations, uh, from past presentations. I, could, I couldn't find them. I have to look for them. Anne has given presentations on the fruit diet in Australia, Asia, Europe, and the United States. In her spare time, Anne enjoys gardening, sewing, reading, photography, and walking. Anne believes that fruit diet is the most compassionate, the most environmentally positive, the healthiest, and the most rational way forward for our planet. And she enjoys helping to promote this diet by her writing, talks, and artwork. Please welcome to the front Anne Osborne. Which is the point of the one in the middle? Yeah. That one. Right okay. Mm Well, thank you Rodo for the introduction and thank you very much everyone for being here today. Today I'm going to talk about fruit and cancer and the reason I put this presentation together was because in the past five years I was getting a lot of people coming up to me and saying well you know my friend's got cancer, I've got cancer, I shouldn't be having fruit and this was something that I hadn't heard before only really the past four or five years and I've been doing this diet for about 25 years now and when I started out there was only two main types of raw vegan diet there was the Anne Wigmore, the Hippocrates type of raw vegan diet, which was high in wheat, grass and sprouts and vegetables and lower in fruit. And there was the Arnold Ehret influenced fruit diet, which was based on fruit with tender greens and vegetables if desired. And there was no sort of animosity between the two groups. You just did the one that worked best for you. And I appreciate that many people have healed and, you know, um, rebalanced their bodies through the Hippocrates, so the lower fruit diet. And this talk isn't about saying, you know, what's the best diet for everyone or everybody should be following what I do. Because I think there's no best diet. The best diet is the one that works best for you personally. And I think it's the responsibility of us all to find that out by experimenting, by reading, by networking. But I did feel a need to put a talk together about fruit and cancer. Because everything that I'd read and researched in the past 25 years was contrary to this belief that if you've got cancer, you shouldn't be having any type of sugar at all. And so there's, um, so um, I wanted to look into it more, research it, and find out the reasons why, you know, why is it that people are now saying, you know, if you've got cancer, you shouldn't be having any type of sugar. So I think we've got to have a bit of a, like a biology and a chemistry lesson. And we've got to look at the structure of cells. Now when you're healthy and everything is working well, all the cells in your body are working in harmony and they're working effectively and efficiently to make your body do all the things that it needs to do. But what happens when a person develops cancer is the cancer cells are no longer working in that same efficient and effective way. They become depolarized, and we'll look at that in more detail later. They can change their electric current 
and they're no longer working effectively and efficiently. And what happens is their structure can change. You now, in a healthy body, all our cells are differentiated. And that just means there's all different types of cells. So you've got liver cells and kidney cells and muscle cells and skin cells. And they all work differently depending on what their function and need is in the body. But what happens with cancer cells is they become de-differentiated. And that means that they become all the same and they rapidly multiply. And they become very similar to the cells that when everybody first started out, when the sperm and the egg came together, and there was that rapid multiplication of cells, those cells were not differentiated. That happens at a later stage. And then you'll see when the fetus starts to develop and eye cells and liver cells and kidney cells and skin cells, they all start to specialise. So the cancer cell is de-differentiated. It multiplies rapidly, but the cells are all the same. When the cells of your body are working efficiently and effectively, they get their energy from respiration. And you might remember the respiration cycle going back to chemistry, biology lessons. What happens basically with a respiration cycle is that glucose in the presence of oxygen turns into water and carbon dioxide and produces ATP, which is adenose triphosphate. Now, ATP is the energy currency of the body. We all need ATP in the cells in order to do anything. So all the functions of the cells, all the energy that the cells require is ATP. So it's not the sugar or the protein or the fat as such, that has to be converted into ATP. So it's a bit like if you went to a laundrette and you had a $10 note and you had a load of washing to do, um, and you go to the machines and they only accept tokens. You can't do your washing, so you've got to change that $10 note into tokens and then you can do your washing. And that's a bit like glucose has got to be changed into ATP energy and then the cells can do all their work. And it's a very effective way of getting energy. So one molecule of glucose can produce 38 units of ATP. Now with the cancer cell, what happens is it's a primitive cell. It's gone into a primitive form. And often cancer cells can no longer get their energy from oxygen respiration. And the way they get their energy is through the fermentation of glucose. And it's very energy poor. So that only produces, for one molecule of glucose, two units of ATP. So it's like, uh, you know, sort of, compared to 38, it's a 15th the amount of energy. So that's one reason why a lot of people that have cancer don't have so much energy. Because the energy produced by the cancer cell is much less than by a healthy cell. And so this is where I think we have to look at. This is where it's coming from. In the past about, only about, I think, about five years that I've noticed that people are saying, if you have cancer, you should limit your sugar. Purely because of this fermentation of glucose. And even if you, you know, healthy cells, they still need glucose to get their energy. It's just they use it through oxygen respiration rather than fermentation. And the other thing that people will say is why you should avoid sugar, any type of sugar, if you have cancer, is that fructose will accelerate the division of the cancer cells and it will cause the tumours to grow. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to look at four points that I think are important when we're looking at this allegation that, you know, don't have fruit if you've got cancer. Now the first point is that the body is an alchemist. It can take one substance and it can change it into another substance. For example, you may decide to eat a very, very low fat diet. So you're taking very small amounts of fat, but you may be having a lot of refined carbohydrates. So you may be having a lot of refined sugar, fizzy drinks, um, white bread, white pasta. Now what will happen if you take a lot more refined carbohydrates than you need? You will put on weight in the form of fat. And you can even do it with fruit. There's even people, if they eat too much fruit, it's much harder than if you're eating processed grains and carbohydrates. But you'll put on adipose tissue because both sugars and fats are comprised of the same three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So the body can take sugars and convert them into fats for storage. And similarly, even though it takes a lot of energy to do so, the body can also take fat and convert it into glucose in the body if it's needed. 
So even if you're omitting all sugar from your diet and you're having a lot of fat, that fat still can be turned into glucose for fermentation of the, um, with the cancer cells. So that's the first reason. The body is an alchemist, and so even if you limit your sugar, your body still may change other substances in your body to sugar. The second point, which I think is really, really important, is that all sugars are not created equal. You know, the sugar in a, bo in a bowl of cane sugar compared to the sugar in a mango picked fresh from the tree, that is a world of difference. There's so much difference. But people might say, well, hey, you know, if you're going to do the chemistry thing, that molecule of fructose in that mango, if I look at it, if I look at its chemical structure, it's exactly the same as that molecule in the industrial sugar. So industrial sugar is a term for sugars like high fructose corn syrup and sucrose that's been made in a, a cane factory. And they might say, well, the molecules look the same, so how come they have such a different effect in the body? And there's two main reasons, I think, for this. The first reason why they have such a big difference in the body is because that sugar is not in isolation. That sugar in a piece of fruit is connected with fibre and phytonutrients and that makes a huge difference to how a substance will affect a person. The second reason is an energetic level, a vibratory level that can affect two molecules that may look exactly the same. So first of all, I'm going to give some examples of the first type of um, uh, you know, how it affects having the phytonutrients and the fibre and the other elements in the fruit. And there was a study done that wanted to show the effects of like sugary drinks. So they got a glass of water and they added three tables full of sugar and they gave it to people to drink. And what they noticed afterwards, which you might expect, is huge insulin spikes after the sugar water had been drunk. So that was having a very negative effect on the body. And when that get that insulin spikes, it also floods the blood with fat. So really not a very healthy thing. Now, those researchers then added blackberries and lingonberries to that sugary water. And so there was actually more sugar in there. Instead of three tablespoons of sugar, there was now four tablespoons of sugar. But guess what? the insulin spikes were blunted and the blood was not flooded with fat. So even though there was more sugar in that drink, because it was from fruit, it actually stopped the insulin spikes and blunted them. And then they thought, well, you know, what if we take the fibre out of the fruit? Because there's a lot of people saying, we well, don't have any fruit juice because that just acts like alcohol, it destroys your liver, damages your liver. So they took the fibre out. And when the fibre was taken out, guess what? There was still blunting of the insulin and there was still no fat flooding the blood. And it's now believed that phytonutrients in fresh fruits actually blunt insulin spikes because they regulate the rate at which sugar is absorbed into the intestine. So even if you're eating processed sugar and you're eating a lot of fruit, you can still not get those insulin spikes. And they did another experiment with white bread and blueberries. And they got exactly the same results. When the white bread was eaten, it's high GI insulin spikes. But when the blueberries were added to the white bread, the insulin spikes were blunted. So it just shows that it's not, you can't take the sugar in isolation in fruit and think that it has that effect because it has a very different effect. A third study was done with a sugary um, breakfast cereal. Now we all have like a bank balance, antioxidant bank balance. So if we're eating a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables, we're in the black, we've got a good balance in our bank account. What happens when we eat fried food, very processed food, very refined sugary foods, is that bank balance can get in the red. We can start to get oxidative damage to our DNA, to our bodies. But by eating like fresh fruit and vegetables, we put that bank balance you know, in, back in the black. And this experiment showed what happened after a typical sugary refined breakfast cereal was eaten. The bank balance went in the red. The body was in oxidative damage. When they added a quarter of a cup of blueberries to that breakfast, 
it was still in the red but when they added half a cup of blueberries it went in the black it raised up so we all have this choice you know if we choose to sort of like drain our bank accounts get them in the negative then we're going to suffer health consequences but fruit is a really good way to get our bank balances full of antioxidants back up in the black um, and also water, water's another example. You might say, well, these two water molecules, they look exactly the same. But there's a huge difference between the water from a bubbling alpine spring and, say, tap water from Adelaide. Adelaide is one of the only two ports in the world where ships will not fill up with water because the water is so bad. And that's due to the other things in the water. You know, there might be chemicals, pollutants, fluoride, chlorine. So their examples show that it's not just those molecules in isolation, it's what's included with fruits that make their effects very different in the body from industrial sugars. And now I'm going to look at why vibratory levels can affect two molecules. Has anybody heard of um, Dr. Emoto, The Power of Water? Yeah. He was, um, he's a Japanese doctor and he investigates the effect of thoughts and words and emotions on water. So he gets two lots of water. Now these waters are exactly the same. They've got the same, you know, sort of um, molecular formula, H2O. But one lot of water, he was oh, beautiful water, you know, give thanks to the water, give positive thoughts to the water. And then the other lot of water, oh, you horrible water, you disgusting water, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And then he would crystallise out the water samples and what he found was that the crystals from the waters that he said oh you know I love you you're beautiful I'm grateful thank you form beautiful crystal patterns but the water from the samples that had been sort of like hate you you awful terrible water were ugly you know um, disjointed patterns so that can show that there's sort of a vibratory level that can affect molecules as well so that's a big thing, the, the second point. There is a huge difference between the fruit in sugar and industrial processed sugars. Has anyone ever been in a sugar mill and seen what happens? Yeah. I mean, it's, like a, it's sort of like a, a chemical laboratory, isn't it? The sugar cane goes in there, there's loads and loads of processes, and it comes out the other end as something that is very, very different. So I think it's so important not to lump together the fruit in sugar with industrial sugar because it doesn't stand in isolation. And the third point is that this kind of idea of, okay, so if you've got cancer and it's feeding off glucose, we're going to starve it. It's very much in that kind of school of thought of like, you know, cut, burn, poison, destroy the cancer. You know, the cancer is the enemy, we're going to cut it out of the body, we're going to remove it, we're going to destroy it. And I think that way of thinking doesn't really look enough at well, why did the body get in that situation in the first place? You know, the internal environment, the milieu of the body. How did it get to that place? Just removing the cancer or starving it or burning it is not going to answer that and it's not going to stop other health challenges occur. You know, it's not looking at the cause. It's just, you know, cutting something out, starving it. And the fourth point is if the fruit in sugar is so detrimental if you've got cancer, how is it that thousands of people have healed from serious cancers using a fruit or a high fruit diet? And in the second part here, this is what I want to talk about. And I want to give some examples of pioneers in this field who have helped hundreds of people heal, um, or some thousands of people heal from serious health challenges, you know, including cancer, using high fruit diet. Right, now the first pioneer is a Scottish guy called Dr. Robert Bell, and he was a real radical for his time. Um, he was born in Scotland and he moved to England to practice in London as a doctor. And he was a very um, eminent doctor. He was Vice President of the International Society for Cancer Research at Battersea Hospital. He practiced from 1870 to 1928, so he had a very long career. He wrote this book, which is from 1923, The Conquest of Cancer. 
and he was very highly esteemed. He wasn't some quack, you know, putting out these ideas about, you know, fruit and vegetables healing cancer. He was offered a knighthood by Edward VII because he was so esteemed in royal circles and he was so much appreciated as a doctor. Now, Robert Bell very much believed that it was the internal environment of the body and it was the foods we put into it which could help us not get cancer or heal the body from cancer if we did have it. And in um, 1894, he stopped surgery. He stopped practicing surgery because he believed that it wasn't the way. It wasn't the thing to take the cancer out of the body. That wasn't the solution. The solution was to change the diet and lifestyle. And I'm just going to read out a couple of of quotes. He says, ripe fruit in its natural, not cooked condition, contains radioactive energy and exerts a beneficial effect on healthy cell metabolism, which is invariably observable when a natural dietary is substituted for that which has undergone the process of cooking. Dead matter from whatever source was never intended for the food of man or animals. And whenever it is indulged in, the penalty must inevitably be paid in the form of disease, pain, and premature death. So here's this guy, you know, like um, 100 years ago, promoting raw fruits and vegetables as being an optimal diet for humans. Um, he also says, My contention that a vegetable and fruit diet is calculated to develop in man an amount of stamina, staying power, and health which it is impossible to obtain by the consumption of flesh food. There are certain con constituents in vegetables and fruits, namely vitals. So this is what he gave to this, this element in fruits and vegetables that was destroyed by cooking, this special principle, this energy. Um, so it's hard to know if it's like, he's not just referring to uh, vitamins and minerals, which aren't all destroyed by cooking, but it's this kind of energy that we get, that if anyone's been on a raw food diet and they may you know, experience a surge in energy and well-being. If we look around, we shall find that man is the only member of the animal kingdom who destroys his food value by cooking. He ignores the fact that the cells of his body, like those of every living creature, are only able to retain a healthy functional activity if they are provided with a papulum from which the living principle has not been destroyed by heat. So, you know, this guy is, is really promoting raw fruits and vegetables as being the diet for cancer and in his, his books you know got some amazing little gems in there and I'm just going to read something else out from his book and it's kind of sad because he was around a time when allopathic medicine was just taking off and there was a real potential at this time if people had followed these teachings rather than the allopathic method of treating cancer that cancer actually wouldn't be very well known today and I'll just read a quote from the book I feel I may with confidence state that it is not my own experiences alone, but that of many others, which enables me to testify to the value of this method of treatment. And for my part, I feel confident that the prediction which I ventured to make at a public lecture two years ago, that cancer will not only be a curable, but practically an extinct disease before 10 years have elapsed, will be verified notwithstanding the hidebound prejudice which at present mitigates against its fulfilment. So he was saying in 1923 that by 1933 cancer would be pretty much extinct if people followed the premises in these books and his teachings not to cut out cancer, not to burn the body, not to give it radiotherapy and chemotherapy but to change the diet and lifestyle and to change that environment because he very much believed it was the environment of the body and the state of the blood which protected people from cancer. Okay, so the second pioneer that I want to talk about is a woman called Joanna Brandt. Has anybody heard of Joanna Brandt and the Great Cure? You can literally get this for a couple of dollars, this book, off uh, Abe Books or Second Hand or eBay. And um, it's a very, very interesting and powerful book. Um, and I would recommend it to anybody that um, you know is interested in um, fruit diets and healing from cancer. So Joanna Brandt was a South African woman. She was around about the same time as um, Robert Bell. Um, she suffered very severely from stomach cancer. At one point, the tumour in her stomach was so big that it divided her stomach in two. 
and she decided not to take any allopathic treatments. And the reason she decided not to take any allopathic treatments was not because she didn't agree with them, she just wanted to die, she'd had enough, she was having some other challenges in her life as well, and she thought, well, I'll die sooner if I don't take any treatment. But by not taking the treatment, she became open to more alternative methods of healing. And she tried water fasting, and that helped her a great deal. But nothing cured her cancer completely until she adopted the great diet and she was completely cured, the tumour was completely gone and she was so amazed by this, so enthusiastic that she left her family, she left her husband and her children, she set off on a boat from South Africa to the United States in 1927 because she really really wanted to share with people what had happened to her and she wanted to open clinics up in the United States and she had a long journey to get there. When she got there, she was faced with more challenges, but she didn't give up. She had to find allopathic doctors to get on side who would support her so she could open clinics. And in her book, there are many testimonies of people that have been healed. And one of the testimonies that I find particularly um, you know, interesting is of a woman in the Bronx in New York City. Um, Joanna Brown was called out to the family. And uh, when she got there, the woman was really, really sick. And Joanna Brown thought, well, I can't do anything for this woman. She's in the last final stages of cancer. And she had stomach and intestinal cancer. The woman was vomiting like 24-7. She was just throwing up all the time. And Joanna Brown thought, I'm going to tell the family I can't help. It's too late. But she saw the love that the sons had for their mother. And she thought, OK, we'll give it a go. And they started off by giving this woman just a few grapes. Within 24 hours, the vomiting had stopped. And there was a long healing process. Because when a cancer starts in the body, or when it's found, or when it gets to that late stage, it's not just something that happens overnight. I think it takes something like 100 days or something um, for the cells to multiply, you know, and then it's a long process before you can even visibly you know, see a cancer growth. So this was something that had taken a long time to develop. And it wasn't gonna heal overnight, it was two months two months of being on the great cure and this woman was healing very well and then suddenly her legs started to swell and um, one of her sons said it's the end he thought his mother was going to die and Joanna Brown said yes it is the end it's the end of the cure and they put great compresses on the woman's legs and the poisons were taken out and the woman healed completely so from being on her deathbed, she healed completely on a diet of 100% grapes. And there's many other stories in the book as well. So the grape cure works well for many people. And Joanna Brand sort of like said the reason why it works so well, it's like a, a threefold reason. It's like a pyramid there. So I've got those lasers somewhere. Here we go. So the grape cure gets rid of the tumour. It dissolves the tumour. It also eliminates toxins in the body, but at the same time it builds new tissue. And this is an important thing because a lot of people with cancer lose a lot of weight. They lose a lot of energy because the, you know, the cancer cells aren't able to get the same amount of energy as regular cells. And for them, water fasting may not be an option because they may not be able to afford to lose any weight. But the great cure builds the tissue. So at the same time as it's dissolving the tumour, the same time that it's cleansing the blood and the body, it's building new healthy tissues. So this is why one reason why grapes can be such a healthy diet for people that have cancer. So quantities. Um, if you're doing a mono diet and you're in good health and you're very active and you have a lot of energy and you want to maintain that, you can eat quite a lot of that fruit. But when the mono diet is being used as a cure, it works more effectively if certain amounts are eaten. So for Joanna Brunt, it was a minimum quantity of one pound, or about 500 grams, and a maximum of four pounds, so, you know, like two kilos. So they're not huge amounts. And the reason for that is it's almost like a camouflaged flat fast when you're doing a mono diet. And by having smaller quantities, it allows the body to heal and repair. So if somebody's got acute health issues and they go on a mono diet, generally smaller amounts allow for faster healing. So Joanna Brandt found that the diet was most effective if not less than a pound was eaten, but not more than four pounds. So that was what the best results were. But you know, I mean, there's a, a lot of uh, interest in the grape cure. It's been um, in Southern Europe, it was 
people would eat badly all year and then they would go to the clinics for two weeks for the grape cure, which isn't ideal, you know, because really you need to eat well all year round. But it is quite a long-standing cure. Um, if you're interested, you can Google it um, and or read more by reading um, the grape cure book. Okay, now I just want to mention somebody who is a bit more local. Has anyone heard of Ross Horn? Yeah, Ross Horn, um, he's not alive now, but he lived near Nambour, so he lived on the Sunshine Coast. And um, he was an airline pilot, um, you know, he was in pretty good health, but then he started to get health challenges, um, you know, with his heart. So he adopted the Nathan Pritkin type of diet, which was very popular around that time. And that was a low fat, high starch diet, but included a lot of cooked grains. And what Ross Horn noticed was that, you know, a lot of people that were following this diet, and he was promoting it, he was very much straight down the line, you know, Nathan Pritikin man, but he noticed they were getting arthritis and cancer, some of them. So even though initially it really, really helped with heart disease, that sort of low-fat, high-carb diet, what happened was that over time, people could develop cancer and arthritis. So Ross Horn decided that he was going to investigate and he wrote um, a book, The New Health Revolution, which is really popular. He also wrote a book, Improving on Pritikin. And he started to recommend a fruit diet as being you know, a really important diet and one that gave us what we needed, but without compromising our health in any way. And um, this is the book he wrote specifically about cancer and he recommends a fruit diet as being an optimal diet if you have cancer. And it's an interesting book. It's got quite a lot of scientific stuff about you know, what happens, to, why cancer starts, you know, the change in the cancer cells as opposed to a normal cell. And also he writes a lot about fruit and how important it is. So you know, I'm mentioning him here just because he's local. So if you go in secondhand bookshops, you might well find copies of his book. Um, his name's Ross Horn. Okay. So moving on, the next person I want to talk about is a very, very important pioneer. Um, he's doing a lot to um, help people with cancer, um, and he's doing that with high fruit diets. And his name's Jan Dries. Um, this is the book. Um, again, it's available widely, it's a second-hand book. This, if I was to recommend one book um, on fruit and cancer, this would be the book, mainly because he's still around now, so it's sort of like, you know, he's a, a current guy. And also, his way of looking at things is very unique. He concentrates a lot on light energy, biophotons, vibrations and energy. And he puts it in a very, very scientific way. So it's not all airy-fairy new age. It's very, very rational um, what he says. And he looks at um, you know, people having cancer because of shifts in energies and shifts in vibration. And so um, we'll go into this in some more detail now. The other thing that's interesting about Jan Dries is that he doesn't say, oh, if you're, you know, if you're doing my therapy, you can't have chemotherapy, you can't have you know, um, any radiation therapy. So he works in tandem with allopathic medicines and allopathic treatments. Um, and what he finds is that people that are having a lot of chemo or radiation therapy, if they're on his diet, it actually helps them. They don't get such severe symptoms with the chemotherapy. Um, and so what Jan Dries discovered was a frequency, an energetic frequency, because he looks at frequencies, um, wavelengths and frequencies, which he measures with a device called the Lechner antenna. So he scientifically measured different frequencies. So everything has a different frequency. So there'll be a frequency for the liver and the kidney, and there'll be frequencies of somebody that's healthy as opposed to somebody that's not healthy. So you'll have more of an amplitude. Um, so if a person, for example, um, has got a high um, amplitude on the frequency of cancer resistance, it's very, very unlikely that they will get cancer. Um, and he says cancer resistance differs from the usual defense mechanisms of the body because our normal defense mechanisms are not capable of recognizing tumors as a foreign element. And that's because the cancer cells are part of us. They're not foreign. You know, if you have, if you cut yourself and you get some dirt or some bacteria in your wound, or you inhale a virus, your 
immune system goes into sort of like crackdown because it recognises a pathogen or a bacterium or a virus because it's not part of you. But this is one reason why cancer is so hard to detect because they're your cells. So your normal immune response, your normal defence system doesn't work in the same way because it doesn't go into attack on the cancer cells because the cancer cells are your DNA. They're not some foreign DNA that's coming in. So he says, when a person has low energy, they are more likely to get cancer if the decrease in energy takes place on the frequency of cancer resistance. If a person has high enough bioenergy on the cancer resistance frequency, the person is unlikely to get cancer. So his whole book focuses on foods that raise the cancer resistance frequency. And those foods are fruit. Okay, so Clyde's is based on bioenergetic frequencies. And bioenergetic value is determined by light. It's determined by light energy. And flowers are the best light absorbing part of the plant. The enormous amount of light energy that has been gathered then passes to the fruit. So this is why fruits are very, very high in bioenergetic value and light energy and photons because they absorb it. You know, if you've got foods, his diet doesn't concentrate really on foods that grow below the ground because they don't have that same light energy. They don't have the amount of biophotons or the intensity of um, biophotons. And certain fruits vibrate on the frequency of cancer resistance. And this is the sort of the main point that underpins his whole book. He concentrates on giving people who have cancer those fruits which vibrate highly on the frequency of cancer resistance. And again, in the book, there's some amazing testimonials from his patients. There was one woman, her name was Aunt J. Mayer. She had a tumour under her collarbone, and she went to see her oncologist. And she was really, really excited, because she was so excited to start on the dry cancer diet. And she went to see him, and she told him all about it. And he looked said, nobody's ever cured themselves by a diet. So anyway, off she went. 11 days later, when she'd been following the dry cancer diet, she went back to her oncologist and he couldn't find the tumour. It was completely gone. And he said, what diet have you been on? She said, well, nobody's ever cured themselves by diet. And he apologised to her and he said, I've never seen anything like this in my whole history. Um, he said, I'm about to retire, but I really want you to be my last case. This is the touchstone of my career. That's just one example. So, you know, it's a very powerful diet for enabling people to heal from cancer. So these are the fruits, I mean the book covers everything and he classifies you know, food into different categories. His number one category is those fruits that vibrate on the frequency of cancer resistance. So they've got that frequency, they've got that wavelength. And the number uno, number uno the number one, is the pineapple. Uh, also in the number one group are cactus fruits, so prickly pears and dragon fruit avocados, raspberries, and orange flash nuts. So of all the foods they tested, these were the fruits that vibrated on the level of uh, cancer resistance. And within those fruits, the pineapple is so good because, if you see, the means of the pineapple is growing in my garden. Pineapples are really easy to grow. If you just get the top of the pineapple and throw it down in your garden, in two years, you know, it's often grow a pineapple fruit. So that's the little flowers. Not many people see that. So each pineapple fruit is made of lots and lots of the little fruits. They've all got their own flower. So all those flowers are absorbing all that light energy. All those biophotons are going into that pineapple, which makes it very, very high um, in terms of biophotonic energy. So pineapples are really good for that reason. Okay. So fruits that have a high bioenergetic value, or BEV, on the frequency of cancer resistance can help depolarize the cancer cell. Because what happens in a cancer cell is it becomes depolarized, which means the charge changes. In a normal healthy cell, the cytoplasm has a negative charge, and the extracellular fluid on the outside has a positive charge. And that keeps a good balance in the cell. It keeps good polarity, and it also um, you know, gives a, a, a high resistance. And um, so a high bed means a high intensity or amplitude of that frequency. So you can imagine like a radio station, you know, or you've got a radio, and you want to tune in to the cancer resistance station, and that's on a certain frequency. 
So uh, oranges may be a great fruit, but they may be high on immune, you know, the, the frequency for immune system. But they're not on that frequency for cancer resistance. So you've got your radio, you turn it on to the, the cancer resistance station, and that's the frequency that you want. Now amplitude uh, means slightly the loudness. So if your, your radio is really loud, you've got a good volume, that means that there's a high amount of amplitude on that frequency, and that's what you want. So with the pineapples, with the prickly pears, with the avocados, with the raspberries, with the orange fresh, fresh melons, they've all got a loud you know, amplitude. They've got a high amplitude on that frequency, which is why they are used in the diet. The amount of biophotons is also important, so it's combined. Because the intensity um, or the, the frequency is, you know, sort of like the intensity of the biophotons, but the amount is also important as well. And the number of biophotons is affected by ripeness, storage, chemical soil, and the way the fruit is grown. So if we've got a, a pineapple that's been organically grown, it's been picked ripe, it's been grown in good soil, that will have a lot of biophotons. But because it's a pineapple, it will also have a lot of biophotons on the frequency of cancer resistance, so on a good amplitude. Because you can get an apple, and that apple would have a lot of biophotons in it because it's been grown well, and it's been picked right, it's been talked to while it's grown, and it's been given a lot of milk, but it hasn't got that frequency, it hasn't got that wavelength, or the amplitude on that wavelength. So the fruits mentioned have the correct polarity to aid cancer resistance. So what happens is why the tumours can disappear, why people can heal on this diet, is because the cells become polarised again in a healthy way. So they were depolarised through having cancer, and when they become polarised again, the tumours will shrivel and disappear, and the negative and positive charge will be correct again. And cancer patients need to absorb as much energy as possible. We already know that the cells can't get the same amount of energy as the healthy cells, so they need to get as much energy as possible. When somebody's ill, the nature of their bioenergy changes. So if they then eat a lot of good fruits and vegetables, um, especially fruits on frequency of cancer resistance, their energy will change again. And also what's very important is positive thought and attitude, because positive thought and attitude will also increase um, you know, the, the frequencies of cancer resistance and the amplitude. So a shift in waves can happen, which is why somebody gets ill, a decrease in amplitude, a decrease of electric potential of the cell. So a healthy cell has a certain voltage. When a person becomes ill, that voltage decreases, so the electric potential of the cell is reduced, and that means that all the sort of things that normally happen in the cell, the workings, the energy of the cell, cannot happen. The communication gets affected, and that's what happens with cancer cells. So, some interesting quotes from the book. When all is said and done, the only difference between a cancer cell and a healthy cell is behaviour. So I said at the beginning of the talk, a cancer cell doesn't behave in an effective way, it's not efficient, it doesn't work the same way as a healthy cell works, and that's why we have a problem. But if we can change that, if we can change it so that the cells are again working in an effective, healthy way and their correct polarity, cancer can be cured or healed, the body can heal without resorting to surgery or invasive methods. Healthy cells have a constructive function, cancer cells have a destructive function. So curing cancer means increasing the energy on the frequency of cancer resistance in such a way that the cancer cells are depolarized and they become healthy functioning cells again. Um, again, amount. Um, mentioned this with Joanna Brandt, so the amount of fruit. And he says most people eat fruit far too quickly. If fruit is eaten slowly, the sugars are released slowly and will influence the saturation centre. But if fruit is eaten too quickly, the saturation centre will only respond when the stomach expands, which impels one to eat larger amounts. The stomach cannot deal with such large quantities and there will be fermentation. Those who follow the diet are expected to eat small quantities of bioenergetically beneficial foods so their weight remains stable and increases slightly. So he's not advocating people starve, he doesn't want people to lose weight, but he wants people to eat good quality, 
um, food that's full of nutrition and um, you know bioenergetic value, um, but not eat more than is optimal. And that means they'll have perfect digestion. Because as well, sometimes if a lot of food is eaten, it can pass very quickly through the digestive system. We don't always assimilate as much as we can. It's smaller quantities that are eaten more slowly. Okay, so uh, moving on to one last pioneer. Um, this is a guy called Dr. Frank McCoy. And he's around sort of 1920s, 1930s. Again, a book that could be got. Um, for a couple of dollars, I think I paid for this second hand. The postage cost more than the book. And he wrote a book called The Fast Way to Health. Um, he was a doctor who was practicing in the States. And he helped many, many people heal from all sorts of illnesses, not just about cancer, all sorts of illnesses, using fruit mono diets. So he used orange juice diets a lot, he used grapefruit diets, tomato diets, lemon juice, and water. And people came with all sorts of complaints from bronchitis to deafness, from catar to you know, digestive issues. And putting them on a mono diet, um, they were healed. Um, and that was quite radical for his time, you know. Uh, people weren't necessarily eating a lot of fruit, and they certainly weren't just eating fruit. And then he would put them on a sort of a, a modified diet when they were healed. But that's an interesting book. And yeah, we just have some cancer patients in there as well. Um, and we've got an ounce. He says, so um, he would say like a glass of orange juice three times a day, or the juice of one orange every two hours. And that's not huge amounts. But this is for people that have got, you know, um, acute or chronic health issues. And they are healing similarly to a water fast. You know, if you're healthy and if you're very active and you're on a mono diet, you're going to eat a lot more than that. But, you know, these are the quantities so the body can heal. Because the less the body has to deal with in terms of digestion, the more energy it has to heal and repair. So they were the pioneers that I wanted to look at. Um, so to conclude, I would never say that the fruit diet is the best diet for everyone. I really do think it's really important that everybody finds a diet that works best for them. I certainly think that for everybody to increase the amount of fruit a bit in their diet, you know, is a good thing. Um, everybody's slightly different. We've all got, you know, different past health histories. Our ancestors' health histories will also affect where we are. So some people do better on slightly different diets. But I do think that fruit is being falsely sort of like maligned in terms of people saying avoid fruit if you have cancer. Because there is such a huge difference between industrial sugars and the sugars found in fruits. And I would never recommend anybody, whether they were healthy or whether they were sick, to eat a lot of industrial sugars. Because I think they have a very, very different effect on the body. And a really good book to read, I read this book about 30 years ago is called Sugar Blues by William Dufty and he writes about how different the sugars are you know, when they're refined and the effect they have on the body, they don't have an alkaline effect, they have a, you know, sort of cause the body to become acidic and um, it was very interesting actually because he was, um, he was on a pretty bad diet, he was in a pretty bad state of health and he happened to sit next to um, a famous um, actress at um, an event and um, Gloria Swanson, have you heard of Gloria Swanson? Yeah, anyway. And he was just about to put a sugar lump into his cup of coffee. She said, stop, don't do that. What are you doing? Do you know how bad sugar is? And he had no idea. And so he learned a lot from her and he wrote that book. So if you want to know how, just how bad industrial sugars are, it's a really good book to read. Um, but the sugar in fruit has such a different effect because it doesn't stand on its own. It's combined with phytonutrients, and like nature's amazing, so it packages, you know, sugar, so we get this energy from sugar in the fruit, but it also puts in the phytonutrients, so that the sugar will be really slowly now good. It won't give us sugar spikes, and it actually can help blunt insulin spikes when we're eating processed sugar. You know, it's a marvelous food, I think, fruit. I think it's not fair to sort of bag it in the same category as refined sugars. Um, but, you know, I, I never say that everybody has to do this diet or it's the best diet for everyone, but certainly I don't think fruit is a harmful food, especially if it's organically grown, you know, especially if it's um, grown to love and care in good soil. So um, that's really what I wanted to say today. And I'd like to say I've got some questions.